Joining us now to analyze today's headlines is Christina Mislan. She's an assistant professor of journalism studies at the Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome, Christina. Hello, Sonali. Saudi Arabia's 90-year-old King Abdullah has died. His brother, Crown Prince Salman, has been named his successor. The decades-long reign of a man seen as a moderate in his dealings with the West and a fundamentalist in his nation's imposition of Islamic law will likely remain in place. Controlling about a fifth of, of the world's oil reserves, Saudi Arabia has symbolized much about Western hypocrisy in its dealings with the Arab world. King Abdullah saw the Arab Spring movements for democracy as a threat to the stability of the Middle East and often acted to suppress them. Just south of the Saudi border in impoverished Yemen, a takeover by Shia militias called the Houthis has now resulted in the resignation of President Hadi, whose government received substantial support from Saudi Arabia. Christina, how do you view King Abdullah's legacy in Saudi Arabia and how the U.S. has played along for all these years? Well, at least in the West, Abdullah's legacy is being seen as one that has held on to kind of more conservative, traditional practices and customs influenced by Islamic law. But at the same time, um, he's seen as someone who has introduced what the West would like to call some modern sensibilities. Uh, for instance, women could go to university alongside men. But um, and the, the fact that the U.S. Uh, has played a long role in supporting uh, Saudi Arabia and keeping it as an ally is not surprising in that what I think might be interesting and could actually highlight some more some of these contradictions is, um, you know, if we were to ask the U.S. government what its stance on is on um, other issues dealing with women in Saudi Arabia, for instance, the U.S. often will use the oppression of women in the Middle East as a way to justify its impositions and its occupations. But at the same time, there's a different um, relationship that it has with Saudi Arabia. So I think maybe that conversation can actually help highlight some more of these contradictions, again, that we often see with U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And then here in the United States, just hours after GOP House representatives killed their own bill, banning all late-term abortions, they passed a watered-down version of the same bill yesterday. That bill, seen as a Plan B, calls for a ban of taxpayer money for abortions, all but ensuring that poor women have even less access to reproductive health care. Outside the halls of Congress, thousands of people rallied in an annual event dubbed the March for Life to mark the anniversary of the Supreme Court ruling in Roe v. Wade. The march's attendees who want to see Roe overturned were, according to news reports, dominated by young people this year. The March for Life is considered the largest anti-abortion event of the year, attracting people from all over the nation and world. Pro-choice activists also gathered, attempting to block marchers. Well, Christina, given that the majority of the public remains pro-choice, are you disheartened by the GOP's moves? I don't know if I'm disheartened. I'm definitely annoyed, and I guess I'm not disheartened because I'm not surprised, and this conversation comes up over and over again. But I think, you know, it's interesting that uh, the GOP message is often about the government taking its hands off of the individuals um, that live in this but at a time when it comes to an issue like abortion they're really quick to then say well the government can determine what women do with their bodies and so this contradiction has to be highlighted and so my annoyance comes from a converse, uh, something that we're not having this conversation and we should be instead of a conversation about pro-life versus pro-choice let's talk about this other message about this you know um, what we're basically saying that women have to do or don't or can't do with their bodies. And finally, a young journalist named Barrett Brown was just sentenced to five years in prison and an $890,000 fine for the crime of posting a link to hacked material. The material was about Stratfor, an intelligence contractor, and was obtained by activist uh, Jeremy Hammond, who is also imprisoned. Brown, who has written for The Guardian, Huffington Post, and others, had at one point been involved with the hacker collective Anonymous. He's already served 31 months in prison. Attempting to remain upbeat, he reacted to the harsh sentence, joking, quote, The U.S. government decided today that because I did such a good job investigating the cyber industrial complex, they're now going to send me to investigate the prison industrial complex. Meanwhile, in an interview with the New York Times, Andrew Lack, the head of the U.S. Broadcasting Board of Governors, cited a prominent news outlet, RT, 
as a challenge on the same level as Boko Haram and ISIS, simply because it reports because it reports statements by militant groups in its news. RT, which is a Russian-run English language news site, said it was quote extremely outraged at the comparison. Well, Christina, are we hitting a low point for press freedom in the U.S. today? Well, I don't know if it's lower than any other point, I guess, in U.S. history. For instance, we could look to Gary Webb and um, the issue with the Iran Contra scandal uh, to see that the U.S. has a press journalist in the past. But, you know, Jeremy Cahill had a similar conversation on Democracy Now! recently where he talked about exactly this, the contradictions um, that U.S. politicians, again, more contradictions, you know, U.S. politicians were in Paris. Um, promoting free speech and press freedom. But again, when it comes to maybe be in the United States, they're not doing the same. And you know, the issue about RT um, is funny because if we're going to put them on a list, then we should also put Fox News on that same list. Right. Well, I want to thank you so much, Christina, as always, for joining us today. Christina Mislan is an assistant professor of journalism studies at the Missouri School of Journalism. This is Uprising. We'll be right back.